Tim, finally we get to meet. It's so great to meet you. And thanks for your time. I know you're about to go on to this uh, games panel today with sure. Bing. Yep. And um, I, I guess I'd really love to know what your interest is in the game um, domain. So I uh, grew up a gamer programming games on Apple II since the oh. 1980s. So it's been a core part of who I am. So it's something I do passionately. And um, I also believe that uh, the future of games is to take all these game design principles and go beyond just games and entertainment and actually infect and help um, other industries evolve from health, fitness, nutrition, financial services, even enterprise software and employee type of uh, systems. Things yeah. that make games fun, I always believe can make the rest of life more fun or at least more engaging for people. And sometimes uh, more efficient, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's uh, that underlayer of um, the system, isn't there? It's right. <laughs> the games are a system at heart, and it's the learnings from designing those systems we can use to improve all other systems, whether they're games or not. Okay. So are there any um, game startups that you've actually invested in that have done well, or are there any failures? Like, tell me a little bit about the history of your sure. investing. So I started investing in games back when social gaming and mobile gaming on smartphones first started opening up about three, four years ago. My thesis was that um, originally, games were hard to invest in for VCs because they were hit-based content businesses. So you couldn't tell it would be a hit or not. Mm -hmm. The thing that changed that a bit, though, is when new distribution channels opened up, then it's fair game for someone to become a next-generation publisher and have distribution power. So the bet was that you create a next-generation electronic arts or Activision by amassing new distribution power when platforms like Facebook or MySpace or iPhone opened up, because there was no giant that dominated those spaces. So that that was the bet. It wasn't so much the content, it was actually the distribution play on new platforms. Ah. So that's what led me to invest in companies like Playdom, which Disney acquired, um, as well as Ngmoko, which DNA in Japan acquired. Um, I've also done a few experimental bets on new spaces like healthy gaming. So there's a company called Lumos Labs in San Francisco here. They're the leader in brain training games on mobile oh, yeah. and online. And what's fascinating is they are subscription-based, healthy games. Their business model is more like, I don't know, 24-hour fitness than it is Zynga. And they have grown to be a very impressive size wow. with almost a million paying subscribers. Wow. Uh, and the latest bet I've made, uh, even more ambitious, is um, trying to be the fourth console in addition to Xbox, Nintendo, PlayStation. That's a company called Ouya, which is kind of this you know, um, free-to-play micro console for Android games on your living room TV. Wow. Yeah. Sounds like fun. You, you've got a fun job. You get to like um, test all these games out, right? Well, playing games is part of it and then trying to see what's going on out there. Yeah. I, I would say, you know, um, it's fun getting to play the games. Um, writing checks to companies is easy. Trying to grow them after to be successful mm. and navigate the rapidly changing market, that's mm. hard. So that's mm. almost the expert level, you know, triple black diamond challenge part of the business. <laughs> and, and I guess this is sort of a bit of a new um, domain for me to, to be looking at. And um, I see that it's a very different ecosystem than the rest of the staff startup ecosystem. And I'm wondering, um, what are the pluses and what are the minuses? Because obviously you're more um, attuned to that, uh, sure. that you could tell me about. So the pluses in the games industry is that games historically make money from day one. You know what the business model is, you know how to make money, you know the metrics, and you know what kind of leadership and trends to look for early on for what could make a good games company. The downside is historically also exits meaning acquisitions, IPOs, have not always been easy. We've had a spate of really good exits, the acquisitions of Playdom, the IPO of Zynga, acquisitions of Ngmoko, PopCap, others, um, and now you know big exits like um, uh, well, Riot Games getting acquired, as well as King.com you know, going public, and then we've had um, you know, Minecraft making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So there's a history of making money in this space, but not always a history of stable, uh, sustainable IPOs, because Wall Street doesn't always understand content and games companies. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we've had to find other ways to get exits or have to mine those companies for cash flow. So there is even a debate right now, should venture capitalists be backing games companies is the right format for investment of games companies, perhaps more of a dividend or profit sharing model, uh. as opposed to the classic investing for equity and hoping for a giant acquisition or IPO. Mm -hmm. That's you know kind of a big debate these days. I imagine, and again, I don't have uh, real knowledge about this, but I imagine there's not a lot of investors that are focused on this domain. Am I correct? 
Um, for a long time, there were not, and that was either because people sort of condemned it as a content hit based business, okay. or people just didn't, you know, they didn't play games since so they weren't focused on it. I grew up a gamer, yes. uh, and so you know, there there are a good three, four, five of us who have always loved games. You know, Bing Gordon at KP, yep. Mitch uh, at Benchmark, myself. Uh, I think you know we've grown up with games and have known them, um, but uh, I would say it's also plagued with a lot of roadkill. So for a lot of investors <laughs> who I think jumped in trying to, you know pile onto the bandwagon. It's when a, it became trendy. Yes, yeah. very dangerous place to invest if yes. you kind of don't know what you're doing. Yeah, I yeah. bet, I bet, I bet. It yeah, just seems like a huge domain and it's really, you'd have to know your stuff really, yeah. yeah. Um, one question I really like to ask the investors is, um, I just see that there's just been amazing change in the industry in the last few years uh, when I've been here and yeah. involved. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm always really interested in every investor's perspective on those changes. Obviously, we've had the Jobs Act last yeah. year with the crowdfunding that's changing things. The other thing that I'm interested in because I came from Europe um, and originally Australian um, is that startup ecosystems are springing up all over the world. I mean, I, I'm just like amazed. Venture capital is happening in everywhere, even in Australia now. Right. And I'm like, oh my God, it's, um, it's just rife in the last few years. It's just grown so much. So obviously not just the US or Silicon Valley, but now it's becoming much more of a global business model. So I'm wondering where do you think it's going and, and what does that mean for you as venture capitalists? Um, I think the good news is entrepreneurs have more means to raise funding than ever before, which is good because what it does is it democratizes entrepreneurship and allows more people to create and start companies, whether it's through angel funding, uh, micro angels, you know, crowdfunding, angel list, things like that, as well as uh, regular traditional VCs. There are more opportunities for people to start companies than before because it's gotten cheaper to start most types of companies, especially consumer companies. You don't need big checks from VCs to get started. In some ways, that makes my job a little easier because because for really speculative plays, they might be able to get their first seed funding from angels or crowdfunding and then prove that market demand first, yes. right? So then yes. I can look at helping them grow and scale. So it's it's interesting though, because what it means is there's thousands and thousands more companies, so there's much more to keep track of. So the noise <laughs> level is higher. Um, a lot more work for you too, right? Yeah, just to pick through the noise <laughs> yes. and see which ones are yeah. tracking. Yeah. Um, you know, but a couple things are true though too. Even though it's cheaper than ever to start a company, meaning more companies are started, in some ways, it's gotten harder to grow these companies or take them to the end point okay. for a couple factors. One, um, acquiring users at mass scale is still very expensive it, it, once you're outside of early adopters mm. and the technorati, mm. um, especially if you're crossing over into the mass markets. Mm. Um, also, once companies get traction, they tend to attract huge, giant fundraise rounds because of the land grab nature of the market. So it's almost in the later stages, if you can't get that war chest, you may fall behind in the land grab versus competitors. Okay. And then the third factor, which makes it challenging, is Wall Street has higher and higher expectations for companies before they go IPO. What that means is the time until you exit gets pushed out further and further and further, and the requirements are higher and higher, so you have to keep raising more and more money to be able to last that long to get to IPO. Mm. So in some ways, it's easier than ever to start a company, but sometimes in some ways harder than ever to get to the finish line. Right. So it's a very interesting tension. And, and how do you see it ending up for the VCs? Um, <laughs> you know, I think... VCs are, the whole business is evolving and, and, and emerging yes. in new directions as it should. In in the old days, venture capital was more of a cottage industry. It was yes. based on you know inefficient information flow, yes. proprietary relationships, proprietary deals. These days, um, information relationships are very efficient. Mm. Um, everyone has access to every deal. Yeah. So uh, it's not so much about that. It's more about where do you specialize and where do you focus? So we're seeing more and more specialization of firms. Yes by stage, region, sector, business model. Demand, so uh, yeah. in many ways, it's like well, it's like the evolution of the mutual fund industry or hedge fund industry, okay, right? Okay. Be in the old days, it was a very cottage industry. Then everybody got, you had big firms, you had micro firms, and you had boutiques. But nowadays, everybody has some special angle. I think in venture, we'll have the same thing. Everyone will need a really clear playbook yeah. and a really clear focus and um, to find their spot in the ecosystem. So I guess on a, the overview level, it's really quite a good thing. It's like going to get everyone to get their acts together and, and um, yep. 
and make it work better, yeah. make the whole industry work better. Right, and so it's kind of evolve or die, right? Yeah. So we're going to have a lot of venture capital firms that are unable to find their place in the new ecosystem. They will quietly fade away. Mm -hmm. Some of the ones who have will be able to last and they will keep evolving and pivoting as well. Mm -hmm. Plus you have a whole crop of new firms, first super angels, then they become micro VCs, then they become mainstream VCs. So it's kind of, uh, well, it's just like when you have new platforms, right? Yeah. Uh, old giants go away, new giants yes. emerge. So yes. I yeah. think the same thing will happen in the investment industry too. Great, great. Well, um, I'm sure we'll be able to have another interview a few years down the line and see where we, where we actually end up. Yeah. So lovely to speak to you and, yeah. and to finally meet you. And thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Okay.